data of our uh, adjusted program, and that is our presentations of uh, of individuals we may not have heard of, but has contributed mightily to uh, to our heritage and our and our culture and to this country at at, at large. And so, at this time, uh, who's going to give the first presentation? Well, that's going to be. Deacon Tyrone Flowers. All right, yeah. Deacon Tyrone Flowers. Do you need somebody to work the camera? Good morning, Truth and the Light. Good morning, Good morning Deacon. Deacon. And my presentation is going to be on somebody that's uh, relatively famous is going to be on Bill Russell mm -hmm. and our uh, the last uh, slide that was shown um, Minister Gaines pointed out look at all of those mm -hmm. rings and that's what he is most famously recognized for as one of the greatest players in basketball history but he is also known by a lot of people as one of the greatest winners in the history of team sports. In addition to the rings that was displayed on that slide, that was his 11 NBA championship Whoa. rings. In addition to that, he also won three college basketball championships and was a member of the 1960 Olympic championship mm -hmm. team. So he was well decorated as a player. And also in addition to that, the last two championships he won as a player coach for the Celtics when the great Red R back named him the first black coach in any major professional sport mm -hmm. smashing yet smashing like yet another barrier mm -hmm. and in addition to his work as a basketball player he has done great works as a civil rights mm -hmm. icon yes. and a warrior mm -hmm. for rights for all people mm -hmm. and I'm going to have Minister Crystal roll a, roll a uh, clip on Mr. Russell showing his uh, background mm -hmm. and uh, what some of what inspired him to his works. Farming tools, and he would uh, 
say if you had two acres, he would work it to get the crops come in, and then you would uh, work out agreement how to split the crops. I see. And uh, and so he was. There was no one person that he wanted. He wanted no one person to have control over him. Mm. <laughs> Independence. Yeah, that, I, I think that came from um, his observation of the free slaves and how that when they were on plantations, one person had control over their lives. Yes. And he wanted to have control over his life. So that certainly did pass on through the generations. <laughs> <laughs> you know, generations are uh, one of the things that uh, I was not aware of. I mean, it wasn't part of my faction, but um, my grandfather had two brushes with the Ku Klux Klan. Um, uh, the second one was they would not be able to school for the black kids. This is in Louisiana, yes. West Monroe. Yes, okay. the, the, the uh, what do you call it, the power structure, if you want to call it, whoever. They were not going to school for the black kids, they didn't know, need to know how to read. So he got together with a few other black guys, and they went to Lumber Yard <coughs> and bought some lumber, and they asked him when it was 40, they said, a schoolhouse and big confrontation, because they didn't want them to buy the lumber, but they bought it anyway. And uh, the the knights of the Klan were very upset about this, and so they confronted him, and he suggested that they leave, <laughs> brother, forcefully. <laughs> yes. Uh, and so um, he built he and his guys built this modern schoolhouse, and they built the whole community put together, and they paid a teacher, I think. Between thirty and forty dollars a year to teach. Is that something? Now he had never spent he never spent a day at school. My father, the benefit that one of the beneficiaries at school, stayed in school until the sixth grade. Mm -hmm. he, he went to that one room schoolhouse. Yes, and he left.
riding habit like mm -hmm. the white women wore. She went into town one day and the sheriff told her to be out of town by nightfall because mm -hmm. how dare a nigger dress fancy mm -hmm. like white people. Mm -hmm. And when she came home, he, he said his grandfather got his shotgun he was ready to put in work. Mm -hmm. So his father intervened with the guy that he worked for and had the sheriff have that deputy apologize for that so there wouldn't be any uh, instance. And uh, Mr. Russell spoke of another time where he was, him and his father was at a gas station and the uh, white attendant was disrespecting his father so his father went in the trunk and got a tire iron, you know, and that de-escalated the situation. The man backed off, but that was one of the last incidents before they escaped the Oakland, as he spoke about. <laughs> you know, so a lot of that was a driving force in the things that he wound up doing in the name of civil rights. You know, he... Um, Probably the most famous thing he did was when Muhammad Ali was banished from the sport of boxing and under the threat of jail for his stance of not going to the Vietnam War. You know, Bill Russell, he banded together with a group of influential athletes of the day, Kareem Matt Dool Jabbar and I. Uh, Jim Brown and some others, you know, and they stood with Muhammad Ali, you know, just to show America, you know, where we were at, that we were going to stand strong as a people for each other and support each other. Amen. And uh, there, was, there was another incident back in the 50s when uh, Mr. Russell played for the Celtics, they had an exhibition game in Lexington, in Lexington, Kentucky, and the team went to a restaurant and they refused to serve the black players. So the team wow. took a stand. They did not play that game and they flew home, mm -hmm. which you can imagine was a very unpopular stance mm -hmm. back at that time. But yeah. Mr. Russell, he was one that never cared about popularity. And when I was doing my research, I saw an incident that I hadn't heard of before. The Celtics went to Marion, Indiana, and was given the key to the city. And they had another uh, incident where they weren't served at a restaurant. So Mr. Russell, he had the mayor located and awakened in the middle of the night so he could return that key. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's been through a lot, and he he's done a lot on the behalf of civil rights, you know. And that's not only important to black people. Civil rights is important to all people, especially yeah. Yeah. in a nation like America, which claims to stand for freedom. So America is at its strongest when freedom is for all citizens and I thank Mr. Russell. We should all thank Mr. Russell for being at the forefront of that. Call. Amen. Well, as, uh, as some of you are, are old enough to remember the Civil Rights mm -hmm. Movement, and all those individuals that participated in it were, were courageous because it was a dangerous time, and they had no compunction about it beating you, putting you in jail, or putting you in the ground. Right. And so, and, and these individuals that we're talking about now are uh, heroic in their own right, because it was even worse when they made their mark. Mm -hmm. And so now, <clears throat> without further ado, we're going to uh, bring up uh, the illustrious and, and wonderful, timeless <clears throat> First Lady of the Church, uh, Mitty Manson. Okay, good morning everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We're going to try to fix these glasses with this headrest. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, my 
poor parents and women in Africa. I don't know how they did this. I have a slight headache already. Because we're going to move right along. I wonder, can you put the... Yes, I'm just waiting for you to get ready. You're okay, ready. I'm ready. I don't know how large you can... If, if, can you see that? Can, mm -hmm. can everyone see that clearly? Mm -hmm. Okay. I thought this was very, very interesting. Uh, it's something I never knew, never thought about. I mean, I just never knew. Mm -hmm. We had all heard of George Washington have wooden teeth, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then there, there was a story that he didn't only have wooden teeth, that he had coarse teeth. Mm -hmm. That that was the wood deep, wasn't it? But when I saw this, I was so moved by mm -hmm. um, a young man named Michael uh, Conard or uh, Cord, uh, Cord. Mm -hmm. no, his name's Cord, Michael Cord, and he wrote this. So I'm going to read this out for you real quick. It's some interesting information. He said, "Ever since I began writing the Freedom's Journal column at the uh, Tribune back in 2015." I always wrote about upcoming events. For example, I'd write that an anniversary date is approaching and then I'd discuss it in detail, but I never wrote about something that after it had already passed. Well, not until now. And now I'm writing about President's Day, which was a few days ago on February 19th. I'm actually writing about President George Washington more specifically, his teeth. I mean my ancestors' teeth. I'm writing about their teeth in the Tribune because racist white folks went crazy trying to defend Washington when I posted some of this historically truthful information on my Facebook page on February 19th. In fact, they unwittingly played a key role in making my posts go viral. I love when I make racists angry. And now I'm going to make them even angrier because the newspaper reaches much more people than my Facebook page does. So here we go. Presidents, not presidents, President's Day is officially called George Washington's birthday according to federal legislation. It was created in 1885 to honor the man who enslaved 316 black human beings at Mount Vernon, Virginia Plantation, and who transported nine of them beginning in 1790 to America's first White House, which was located right here in Philly at 6th and Market. By the way, there is not and never has been a President's Day to honor both Washington and Lincoln or Washington and any other president. In 2001, there was a congressional attempt in the form of House Resolution 420 to combine Washington's February 22nd birthday and Lincoln's February 12th birthday, but it died after failing to get past a, a subcommittee vote. Okay, let's get back to the enslaved black folks. I wasn't there. The entire, the entire bodies was Washington's, Washington robbed them of. He also robbed many of their teeth. Get that. Yes, their teeth. In 1784, Washington had the teeth of enslaved black adults transplanted into his mouth. And five years later, a dentist in Philadelphia made Washington's first set of total dentures shown above. And that's mm -hmm. what they look like. Uh, if you can look closer, that was his rotten teeth on the yeah. bottom. And on the top, you can tell those are African teeth. Mm -hmm. You know, we have a, a very distinct mm -hmm. teeth, most, most Africans. Mm -hmm. And anyway... Uh, he had these, uh, after, uh, the dentist, after he did, he had these teeth yanked from the heads of his slaves. Yeah. So they, didn't, they weren't dead or anything, he just yanked them out. Yeah. Wow, this is the man. Yeah. So if you don't believe me, if you don't believe this, and I did, I didn't at first, mm -hmm. uh, read, George, read George Washington's Teeth, an unconventional guide to the 18th century, which is, um, research, in his research book was written by Robert his name is look like Darton and a war. But if you go online, you can find all of this stuff and you can you can research it yourself. And if you don't believe him, talking about the, the writer, read George Washington, Imperfect God. That's just another uh, instru instrument to find out if this is true or not. His Slaves and the Creation of America. That's another. 
which is a thoroughly documented book written by award-winning author and historian Henry Weinsack. So these are avenues that you can check this out, because I don't just take things as face value. I don't, never have, and never will. But if you still don't believe it and still think Washington would have done such a despicable thing that such barbarities was beneath him, please continue reading. From about age 11 in 1743 until his death in 67 in 1799, Washington and his wife Martha enslaved Africans and their descendants. He And he had a habit of being an unsanitary miser who at Mount Vernon issued to his enslaved blacks for use as their garment, dirty, foul, and manure-soaked wool from the stomach of the sheep. He wouldn't even give them decent wool. Similarly, many of those black laborers had to resort to Listen to this, resort to rummaging through, uh, rummaging for coarse burlap bags. And everybody mm -hmm. know I'm from the South, and a burlap bag, it, it's, not a, it's not a nice feel on your body. But they did that. Just, ugh. So anyway, going on. And uh, he, after he, they got the burlap, the roughest burlap to repair their own clothes. They would go, if they didn't do that, they would go around in rags. In providing a so-called shelter, Listen, so-called shelter, Washington treatment of his fellow men and women was just as bad. Consistent with Wysak's statement that Washington's, in, Washington's enslaved black workforce was miserably housed in a very harsh place is the observation of Julian, and I can't say his name, it sounds like a, a, a Jewish last name, but you'll look at it through the, if you go and, and research any of it. But his last name is spelled N-I-E-M-C-E-W-I-C-Z. He was Polish. He was a Polish poet who resided at Mount Vernon for two weeks. He was there for two weeks with Washington at Mount Vernon in 1798, who described the living condition of many of the enslaved population. We entered some Negro huts. This is him talking. We entered some Negro huts for the habitations cannot be called houses. They are far more miserable than the the poorest of the cottages of our peasants. The husband and wife slept on a, miserable, on a miserable bed, the children on the floor. A very poor chimney, a little kitchen furniture uh, amid the misery, a tea kettle and cups. A boy about 15 was lying on the floor with an attack of dreadful convulsions. So he was probably an epileptic, and this is when this man just came in and viewed that, just that. If you want even more uh, irrefutable evidence of Washington's outrageously inhumane treatment of enslaved black men, women, and children, Google my 2005 article published in the scholarly Pennsylvania magazine of history and biography. It is entitled, The Black Eye on George Washington's White House. Mm. Mm. Amen. 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 And the, and the, I, the, Last but not least, the reason why that was so interesting to me when I read that, I said, because uh, I was going to do another presentation, and uh, when I read that, I said, how in the world, just like I often talk to my husband, pastor, and I asked the question, so how can we expect the, the world to be a good place when the God of this world is Satan, a, the most corrupt thing that was ever created? So without God, that's the norm. That's mm -hmm. what's going to happen. So I said, so the next question when I read this morning, I said, how in the world mm -hmm. can we as African-American people expect a lot of white people, not all because there's beautiful white people, but the culture of the, of the race is that how can they treat us with that kind of respect as an equal when they thought of us like this? How can that be? When the father of our nation... George Washington, that we all learned about in school, we didn't learn about these black other, other people that built the house that he was running. So we as Christians have to say to ourselves, we cannot do, the only thing we should do is pray for the kingdom to come. Yes. But while we're here in our lives and on this earth, do everything we possibly can do to make sure that we do our part. It's not going to step it out. We all know that because when you read the Bible, it's been going on since the beginning. So I just say to each and every one of us as Christians, just we have to keep the faith, keep teaching, preaching, and learning, and discussing. Uh, the youth nowadays are, are coming out of this, this horrible culture that was 
this filtered down from George Washington. Mm -hmm. So it, they just don't, they, some of them can't think of us as equal mm -hmm. when this man is snatching teeth out of our four parents' head to put in his own. So mm -hmm. how can you do that? It was like, the, like that lamp. Uh, like that statue there, that candle, I should say. Yeah. You use, I use it to make pretty, it's nothing to me. It's just to make something look pretty. That's how they felt about us as African Americans. So, on that note, I just pray that God will soon allow his son to come back. Our Amen. 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 Thank you, First Lady, for <coughs> incredible eye-opening presentation about what's really going on there. And so many times we don't get the truth or we get misinformation. You get half-truths or, or plain lies. And that, as she was telling me that this, this morning, I, I was just listening with my mouth open, you know, that, that this individual did uh, such horrible things to yes. other human beings. Yes. <clears throat> so, he asked me that question. I said, well, his teeth were wooden and covered in, yes. in, uh, porcelain. in, in porcelain. Yeah, and she that. said, where did you hear that? I said, oh, uh, uh, a history from the History Channel. Mm -hmm. And no, mm -hmm. his teeth were not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were porcelain, all right. Yeah. They were enamel. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, even in the Bible, I think, what do you guys think? That us being <clears throat> us as being slaves were treated worse than any anything in the Bible that I read. Yes, uh, yes. yes. Oh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. you were. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You were. You mm were. -hmm. I mean, that is sad. Even and the Holocaust. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. They yeah. were bad, treated her ter terrible, but we was for three, how many hundreds of years? years. Four hundred years yeah. compared to them. Not making light of it, but you're right. Yeah. You know, I got mad with God. I believed in God at that time, but, you know, when I would hear stuff like that, I said, if there is a God, why in the, why would he allow something that drastic to happen to a, a human being right. and let these white people still just walk around, la, 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 la lily white. Mm -hmm. I mean, like, ain't nothing happened. You know, like, ain't nothing happened. You know, I said, there, there can't be no God that, that let that happen. happen. But yeah, now I now I see what I was where I was going. Yeah, it, it, and that's just to show you uh, man without God, right. because the, because Satan is the god of this world. Yeah. <clears throat> and and soon our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is going to come back and make everything all right. Amen. Amen. So uh, our next uh, speaker is uh, our illustrious uh, minister. Wilma Jean Gay. <laughs> Why don't you wear the appropriate color for your presentation? <laughs> I tell you, Raider, stay in Raider gear, you'll be all right. <laughs> okay, all right. Good afternoon. I'm not going to hold you long, but this really got my attention. What we all know about the Black Panthers, correct? But what got my attention that these young men, how it began, it was nothing like it ended up being taught to us and taught to our kids and put in the newspaper that they were just ruthless, just, I mean, gang bangers and all this stuff. They were not. Huey Newton, this man had a PhD. His sidekick, all of them had education. They took this, they started out being angels. It was an angelic thing they started to do. But what happened? the police and everybody else got against them. So at this time, I would like to talk about how they took and started WIC. We all, a lot of us women, mothers in here, we know about WIC. I know about it through my daughters, through, uh, you know, teachers, through uh, mothers when I was teaching that they kids were using WIC. So I would like to present this to you all today. It's um, about the WIC program through the uh, Black Panthers.
since the Black Panthers first came on the scene. They were champions of quality to some, the dangerous subversives to others. The surviving Panthers, including one of its most prominent leaders, are still working to make their party's case. All power to the people. The Black Panther Party may have dissolved more than 30 years ago, but you never know it from the looks of this gathering in an Oakland restaurant. They reconvened briefly to celebrate the 80th birthday of one of the Black Panthers' founders, Bobby C. I'm a rounder these days, wow. perhaps a little slow. I did not want to be walking over like this. <laughs> okay. But at 80, Seal hasn't lost a flicker of the fire that helped change the political landscape of the 1960s. This is all power to all the people. We was beyond just power to black people. Time hasn't dulled the sharpness of their swagger, the leather jackets, the berets, and the guns. For many, the Black Panthers and their defiant image remain as relevant and as controversial today as ever. Take Beyonce. When her dancers borrowed the Panthers' iconic look at last year's Super Bowl, both praise and criticism flew. It was a complete revelation, I think, to how the Panthers continue to capture the imagination. It was important to, for folks to feel what going to the newspaper was. Renee de Guzman curated the All Power of the People exhibit at the Oakland Museum. Not in my wildest dreams would I imagine a Black Panther show being a blockbuster. Perhaps that's because the Panthers have become as much pop culture as political party. Their message was branded with contemporary but often inflammatory artwork. They were the first to use the term pig to refer to the police. And to this day, it remains as offensive to police officers as the Black Panthers intended it to be. Why a pig? A pig for them was a dirty animal. It was an animal without morals. And it was also a very dangerous animal. We gotta get rid of the pig! Their approach raised eyebrows and tempers all around the country. But they were not without structure. Seal wrote a strict 10-point platform, the party's founding principles, on this legal band that somehow managed to survive all these years. This is all your Henry. This is all my Henry, my printing. He hasn't seen it in years, but can recite every word of it to this day. We want freedom and power to determine our own destiny. It demanded, among other things, access to better housing, education, and an end to police brutality. Do you think this is still relevant today? Every nickel of it. Yes. 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 A file of angry young Negroes. The Panthers first got national attention when members marched armed mm -hmm. to the floor of the California State Assembly, mm -hmm. taking advantage of the gun laws at the time that allowed a firearm to be carried openly. Mm -hmm. The armed band forced its way past the surprise of the New York State Police. It wasn't just a stunt. Bobby Seale of Oakland read a statement protesting the killing of a young Negro. It was an extension of the Panthers' armed citizen patrol. They had been formed to monitor, some would say intimidate, police. <laughs> the cops said, you can't observe me, and we recite the law. Well, you cannot remove a person properly from you without a due press of law. Step back, you cannot touch my weapon. It is private property. And some black dude said, he said, man, what kind of Negroes are these? <laughs> Huey <laughs> P. Newton was its Minister of Defense. In 1967, he was arrested for fatally shooting an Oakland police officer. Free Huey became the party's rallying cry. And after four trials, Newton's case was eventually dismissed. How much did Huey's trial really galvanize the movement? It wasn't Huey. Dr. Margaret King getting killed galvanized the movement. The tone of a Black Panther rally was more in your face than the often polite protests of Dr. King. Although they claimed that this was all about self defense, they also called for revolution. A violent one, if need be. Many critics saw it not as a movement, but as a criminal enterprise filled with those willing to sacrifice anything for the cause. Who does the power belong to? The black people. All we knew that the system that had enslaved us could not remain in place because it was that system of capitalism on the backs of African slaves that created our 
state of oppression. Elaine Brown rose to become the first female chief of the Black Panther Party. For me, there was no turning back. Once you say you believe in something, you're ready to live and die for it, then that's what you do. Some did die on both sides of the struggle. When police raided a Panther headquarters in Chicago, a shootout left one of the movement's most charismatic leaders, Fred Hampton, dead. Yep. And all hell broke loose. Murder. Kids murdered. Uh, Deputy Chairman Fred Hampton, why he lay in bed. The Panthers called it murder. Mm. Police called it self defense. Mm. The immediate violent criminal reaction mm. of the occupants in shooting at announced police officers emphasizes the extreme viciousness of the Black Panther Party. We were, from the beginning almost, uh, the targets of the federal government. Uh, Jerry Hoover, by 1968, was saying the Black Panther Party was the greatest threat to internal security of the United States. So he's saying, I'm not thinking of a public announcement on this to that way. Hoover even brought his concerns about the Panthers to President Nixon, who could be heard on a telephone call pondering how the FBI could be used against them. On a case-by-case -case basis, you could determine that you would want the bureau to get in. In other words, were you sort of had the scent for the smell of, of, a, of, a, of, a, of a national conspiracy thing? Or do you get the kind of thing like the Panthers and the Panthers and all these rights and the Panthers right? It's something that's at the point where it's basically that kind of a of an action. Found the tape, baby. Smoking gun evidence <laughs> that the Nixon administration started with Nixon himself. Mm -hmm. This dude was given directives to get rid of these Black Panthers. Age was smell of Bobby Seale's view of marrying activism and guns. Case in point, the Black Lives Matter movement, also born in Oakland, that is still fighting police brutality 50 years later. When kids come up and ask your advice today about guns, you tell them you don't need guns today. The cell phone is the best piece of technology we got to observe cops. You can have an international cop watch program without a gun. <laughs> That's where SEAL says the Panthers went wrong, letting their militant protests overshadow what he saw as their larger purpose, community service. The Panthers organized free breakfast programs for kids long before public schools in this country started doing the very same thing. There were health clinics too, food drives, voter registration drives, even an ambulance service. The purpose of the Panther programs was to provide a model, a living model, for what American government should be doing. Mm -hmm. Stephen Shanks documented it all as the Panthers' unofficial photographer. This was in Palo Alto. I love this picture. It was the softer side of the Panthers that his photos often captured. Many never saw the light of day until he compiled them into a book for the Panthers' 50th anniversary. Panthers were parents. Panthers were lovers. You see the Panthers with their wives and girlfriends. You see the Panthers with their children. And you just see the tenderness. I think that's what didn't come out with the militant image that was in the media, marching, wearing the leather jackets, wearing the berets. The party was not just some group of thugs or social do gooders or do batters if you like. We were an organization that had goals and had an agenda and had an ideology. And that shapes everything I do uh, right now, and has uh, for the past 40 years. Elaine Brown continued working as a community organizer and activist long after the Black Panthers began to fray as a party back in the early 80s. She worked for prison reform men, and she still does. She recently organized this urban garden, for example, to help inmates, who she says were jailed unfairly because of their race, get a new start by selling the produce that they plant and pick. This is a continuation of what we did do in many ways. It's not exactly, but it's what I can do. A bright corner in this still impoverished section of West Oakland, where the Panthers were born. By the way, it wasn't just four Black Panthers who were at that party for Bobby Seale. There were plenty of young activists there, too, looking to an older generation for answers to race and justice, and how best to affect the change that the Panthers had hoped would have come long ago.
involved in the civil rights movement and being a part of that beating and jail and mm -hmm. and uh, and all the, all the things that went with it. Mm -hmm. And they did do uh, a lot of good, but but unfortunately they got infiltrated. Uh, there was some bad people that did get in it that was uh, in it for themselves, and uh, and eventually certainly the. Uh, uh, the white establishment went on a murdering spree to uh, literally to wipe them out. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so, but that is a part of this history. That's part of our history, and the, and the struggle still goes on. Mm -hmm. So now to continue the struggle, we're going to have our wonderful deaconess, Penny Rochelle Scott, to do her presentation. <laughs> Well, I chose the story of um, Henry Box Brown, and I had a chance to look over it and do a little research, and it was very, um, it resonated with me because it showed God's, um, it showed this man having faith and Amen. hope and courage mm -hmm. through a very hard and first time for him and lost, and it also put me in the mind of the poem, Footprints, mm -hmm. because he went through all of this and just, mm -hmm. I, I would be asking myself, there's no way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, um, but it was really cute. It's not as elaborate as the rest, but I think you really enjoy it. So I'll show you the, the clip of uh, Henry Fox Brown. Mm -hmm. These boxes serve many purposes today. Almost 150 years ago, a different kind of box changed someone. Boxes serve many purposes today. Almost 150 years ago, a different kind of box changed someone's life. Henry Box Brown was born as a slave in 1815 on a plantation near Richmond, Virginia. By age 15, Henry's life as he knew it changed after the passing of the plantation owner. All property was then equally divided among the four sons. Henry was separated from his parents and then taken by the owner's oldest son to Richmond, where he began working in a tobacco factory. His new master, William, was charged by his father to take good care of Henry. The request was obeyed, and Henry received money to spend on himself and new clothes to wear. Henry also regularly sent to his mother money that he had received. Sometime later, Henry met a young lady from another plantation that he fell in love with. He received permission to marry her from both of their owners. They raised their children until that unforgettable day. Henry came home from work only to find that his wife and children were gone and had been sold to another owner at a plantation in North Carolina. Henry pleaded with his owner to buy back his wife and children, but was no avail. Mm -hmm. His owner's advice was that he was afraid to meddle with his owner's business. Being separated from loved ones twice in his lifetime was too much for him to bear. Five months later, Henry began sharing his thoughts of freedom with a storekeeper that he had become friends with. The storekeeper began to brainstorm ideas of ways to obtain freedom, but none seemed quite right to Henry. Henry stated, One day while I was at work and my thoughts were eagerly feasting on the ideas of freedom, I felt my soul crawl out to the heavens to breathe a prayer to the Almighty God. And I prayed reverently that He would see it in secret and know the inmost secrets of my heart and lend me His aid in bursting my fetter asunder. 
and restoring me to the possession of these rights which men had robbed me. When the idea suddenly flashed upon my mind of shutting myself up in a box and conveying myself as dry goods to a free state. Henry had a box built by a local carpenter that was three feet one inch wide, two feet six inches high, and two feet wide. The storekeeper contacted a friend in Philadelphia who agreed to be the recipient via telegraph at this box. On the morning of March 29, 1849, Henry was shipped via a steamboat with the bladder filled with water to quench his thirst and wipe his face in this small wooden box drilled with three small holes. Henry traveled by wagon then to train. During the transfer between trains, Henry's box was loaded upside down. He describes his agony as this. I felt my eyes swelling as if they would burst from their sockets, and veins in my temples were dreadfully distended with pressure from my head for one and a half hours reaching near death and enduring this agonizing pain. Henry heard a passenger saying he had been standing for two hours and needed to sit. This passenger saw this box flipped Henry's box right side up for a seat. Upon reaching Washington, Henry was transferred to a wagon, and upon arrival at the train depot, the box arrived and was tossed amongst the luggage, transferred onto another wagon, headed to Philadelphia. 27 hours, 350 miles later, Henry's box arrived in Philadelphia and was picked up at the train depot at 7 p.m. by the storekeeper's friend that had received the telegraph. The box was then brought back to his friend's home and opened. First, they tapped on the box and Henry weakly answered. Henry described this excited moment as my resurrection from the grave of slavery. Yeah. I rose a free man when I was two years. He describes this moment as being risen from the dead. After Henry recovered and regained his strength, he burst out into this original Thanksgiving song, which included this verse. And he inclined my ear to hear my calling, and he has put a new song in my mouth. Henry briefly stayed in Philadelphia and soon moved to Massachusetts, followed by New York. Henry Box Brown continued to speak on anti-slavery throughout Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Connecticut, Rhode Island, and Pennsylvania. He used the ordinary to do the extraordinary. What tools will you use to move into the freedom and purpose for your life. I'm Lisa Wigfall, your host, bringing you this week's Did You Know. Yeah, that just goes to show you the extraordinary things that, that God did during this horrific time uh, of, of individuals with perseverance and courage. Could you imagine being in a box like that for that length of time? So who's next? Oh. Yeah. Okay, my, I guess it's, I thought it would be apropos. Yeah, be apropos. Um, my presentation is on Dr. Carter G. Woodson, who is the father of black history. So I, I thought it as we went through black history and all the individuals that made it up, uh, we should uh, uh, honor and, and know about the very man that put that together that uh, it could be known. <clears throat> he was, uh, uh, Woodson would have uh, chosen the second week in February to celebrate Negro History Week because of his birth, birthdays of, Fred, because of the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. He also would provide many different types of black institutions with information and instruction on what Negro uh, History Week was and why it, it, it had a need to be celebrated. Woodson 
along with Rayford W. Logan, Charles W. Wesley, Lorenzo J. Green, and A. A. Taylor, will become true champions of history of the African people. They use the information they gathered through research to write about and teach an alternative history of African people. This story was different from what uh, African American people were used were used to being taught. In other words, he taught the truth. And let me tell you about this guy. As I went through learning about him, uh, uh, he was what you could call a militant militant. Even W. E. B. Du Bois was uh, not uh, strong enough or militant enough for him. <laughs> uh, uh, he was almost like, uh, considered them like Uncle Tom mm. because he was uh, steadfast in what he did, Harvard educated, he had an incredible life uh, uh, coming up and uh, 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 fame and fortune was not his aim. His aim was getting our history out to everyone and uh, he lived a, a very modest life. Most of his life he spent in the basement uh, compiling information together. And, uh, and so many men knew him from Frederick Douglass to W.E. Reed DeWaugh and, and many other uh, uh, fame of uh, uh, black men during the time. And, uh, and he challenged all of them to get more active and to do their part. So this is his, his story. Carter G. Woods, December 19, 1875, James Henry and Anna Eliza Woodson gave birth to one of the greatest minds of the 20th century. Carter G. Woodson in New Canton, Virginia. As a child, Woodson's family was poor and sharecropping was a means his family used to support themselves. As Woodson grew older, he would work as a day laborer in Virginia before his family moved to Fayette County, West Virginia in search of better opportunities. Woodson would begin working as a coal miner and his father would find work doing railroad construction. Because of his family's financial situation, Woodson was not attending school regularly. However, he began learning on his own and mastering the subjects the school taught. As a 20-year-old, he began attending Frederick Douglass High School. Two years later, he graduated high school and moved to Kentucky to enroll in Brea College. Brea College was established in the 1850s by abolitionists who wanted ex-slaves to receive an education. Woodson earned his bachelor's degree from Brea College in 1903. Later that same year, he became a school supervisor in the Philippines, a position he would hold until 1907. The fall of 1907, Woodson will become a full-time student at the University of Chicago, where he will earn his master's and bachelor's in European history. In 1909, Woodson would earn a scholarship to attend Harvard University and eventually earn a PhD in history, making him the second African American to earn a PhD behind W.E.B. Du Bois. After leaving Harvard, Woodson would move to Washington, D.C. and become a teacher at both Armstrong and Dunbar M. Street High School from 1909 to 1919. From 1919 to 1920, he worked as a professor of history, dean of arts and sciences, and head of the graduate program in history at Howard University. He furthered his career as a professor at the West Virginia Collegiate Institute from 1920 to 1922. Finally, later in 1922, he would become the director of the Association for the Study of Negro Life and History and his return to Washington, D.C. 1915 was the year that Wilson founded the Association for the Study of Afro-American Life and History because he noticed the need to bring African history to the forefront. It was no secret that the history of African people was perfectly hidden and overlooked. This was unacceptable to Wilson. He would next create his own publication called the Journal of Negro History in 1916. And in 1921, he all established the African American Home Associated Publishers Press. The February of 1926 was the year Woodson would create Negro History Week to educate African American people about the richness of the history of African people. Woodson would work extensively lobbying to make Negro History Week be recognized federally by the United States. It was important to Woodson that African history was available for every African American to access. With that thought in mind, the Negro History Bulletin was published in 1937 to help Woodson reach his goal. 
The Journal of Negro History was used by Woodson to provide a realistic depiction of black life in America. It portrayed blacks as human beings from many different walks of life. Because of the publication, black people were able to learn that we were more than slaves and sharecroppers. Woodson would also choose the second week of February to celebrate Negro History Week because of the birthdays of Frederick Douglass and Abraham Lincoln. He also provided many different black institutions with information and instruction on what Negro History Week was and why it had a need to be celebrated. Woodson, along with Rayford W. Logan, Charles W. Welsey, Lorenzo J. Green, and A.A. Taylor would become true champions of the history of African people. They used the information they gathered through research to write about and teach the alternative history of African people. This story was different from what African American people were used to being taught. Woodson and his colleagues were able to provide the people with stories directly from African American people and other African people from around the world. In 1926, the NAACP honored Woodson with the Spanish Honor Medal for his efforts in promotion and education of African history. Woodson's association, which was the main vehicle for educating black America about his past, was initially funded by white corporations. Woodson refused to affiliate his organization with HBCU, so he lost his funding. From that point on, he was supported by the black community. 1915 was the first time Woodson became a published author with his work for education of the Negro prior to 1861. He also published four monographs, five textbooks, five collections of source materials, 13 articles, and five collaborative sociological studies. He was dedicated to educating black people about who they were and also promoted people researching for themselves. Woodson is noted as one of the first scholars to study slavery from the experience of the slaves. He was also able to capture the true horrors of terror African people faced on a daily basis. He was noted for publishing such works as The Negro Way to Turn, The Negro Professional Man and the Community, A Century of Negro Migration, A History of the Negro Church, The Negro in Our History, The Miseducation of the Negro, and The African Background Outline. Woodson died in 1950 in Washington, D.C., being regarded as the father of black history because of his contributions to the history of black people, as well as being the champion behind Negro History Week, which eventually became Black History Month. If it were not for people like Carter G. Woodson and J.A. Rogers, it would be even more difficult now for us to know our story. Mr. Carter G. Woodson, we're proud, proud to stand on your shoulders. For more information, please visit www.onetheshoulders1.com Amen. 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 I never heard of him before. Mm -hmm. I found him.